I welcome everyone. Thank you for joining Continuous Learning with BioGuard. It is my pleasure to introduce our webinar speaker, Dr. Jin Wen Luo. Dr. Luo received her DBN and master degree in clinical veterinary medicine from Nanjing Agricultural University in China. Currently, she is a specialist at veterinary of the Marology and owner of Fuku Pet Hospital, providing specialty of thermic services for small animals. She's also serving as the tutor for master student at Nanjing Agricultural University. Feline herpes virus type one is a major cause of upper resp respiratory disease in cats. Young and adolescent cats are most susceptible to this common infection. FHV1 infection, commonly referred to as to phenyl viral rhinol trachitis, can cause upper respiratory signs, ulcer and uh, cornea or keratitis and fever. Attendees might learn epidemiology, pathogenesis, ocular ma uh, manifestations, diagnosis, and treatment options for FHV1 infection from this webinar. We are glad to have uh, uh, her as the speaker for this webinar. Without further ado, uh, let's welcome Dr. Luo. Uh, sorry, uh, some setting issue. Uh, okay, it's fine now. Hello everyone, my name is Jing Wen Luo. I have been engaged in the clinical work of small animal ophthalmology for nearly 10 years. And today I could talk about feline herpes virus 1 and related eye diseases. I would like to thank BioGuard Corporation to, for inviting me to give this speak. And you can follow them by scanning these QR codes. I'm from China. I work in a specialized small animal hospital in Jiangsu province. You're muted, right? You can see where I am on the map. with activity against.
relationship between environmental conditions and the survival time. When the ambient temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, the viral can survive for one month. Then with, with the increase of the ambient temperature, the survival time of virus becomes shorter. And conversely, the colder the ambient temperature, the longer the virus survived. In humid environment, the virus can survive for 18 hours. And in dry environment, the virus can survive for 12 hours. Okay. Now let's talk about the epidemiology of this virus. The domestic, domestic cat is the main host for FHV1. There's no evidence of human infection. Cats that are shedding are the main sources of infection, which include the acutely infected cats and the latently infected cats who are experiencing reactivation. The main source of transmission between cats are oral nasal and conjunctival secretions, in particular respiratory secretions, which are passed on via sleezing, contaminated fomites, and unhygienic handling practices. Here's a question. Here's a question. How far is a, is a safe distance between cages? How far is a safe distance between cages? How far? If you know the answer, please tell me. Okay. Yeah. Although a minimum distance of 45 centimeters between cages has been stipulated by the Association of Shelter Veterinarians, it is, rec it is still recommended that The distance between cages probably has to be greater than one meter to have an effect. So we still recommend it. The distance between cages and it has to be greater than one meter. Okay, let's move on to the second topic: pathogenesis of FHV1 disease. Firstly. Let's look at the primary infection. Primary infection occurs uh, most frequently in kitten and adolescent cats as maternal antibodies decline from around eight weeks of age. The virus preferentially infects epithelial cells of conjunctival tongue cells, nasal mucosa, and cornea. The mucoepithelial cells are destroyed and lysed by rapid, rapid replication of the virus, which causes neutrophil infiltration. Lesions are characterized by multifocal epithelial erosion with inflammation. After that, the epithelium is detached and ulcerated. This process usually takes two to six days to develop. During this period, during this period, we may see the clinical signs like fever, depression, anorexia, serous or serosanguineous ocular or nasal discharge, conjunctival hyperemia, sleezing, and less frequently salivation and coughing. It is, uh, 
it is notable that secondary bacterial infection is common. And if secondary infection occurs, the secretion then become purulent. Okay. The corresponding disease are rhinitis, conjunctivitis, superficial, and deep corneal ulcers, in particular, dendritic ulcers, symblepharin, oral and skin ulcers, and less frequently, dermatitis and the neurological signs. And then, almost all infected cats go into latent state. This is a clinically quiescent phase. FHV1 variants invade sensory nerve endings of the trigeminal nerve and travel to the trigeminal ganglion. Here, FHV1 develops a latent state in which the genome persists in exosomes within the cell nuclei of the trigeminal ganglia. And almost all infected cats become lifelong carriers. Okay, then is the recrudescence. Recrudescence may induced experimentally by glucocorticoid treatment in approximately 70% of cats. And other reactivating stresses include lactation, moving into a new environment, or other, other stresses. And uh, recrudescence means the virus is reactivated and cause viral replication and the migration down the sensory axis to epithelial tissues. This may result in three outcomes. Number one, subclinical shading. Number two, clinical signs similar to those of the primary infection. Number three, development of immunopathological disease. Most typical is chronic stomal keratitis. Okay, on the third topic, ocular manifestations of FHV1, let's relax and look at some pictures. The, the first picture of Thomia neonatorum. This is ha what happened to a young kitten. To a young kitten. Ocular FHV1 infection in neonatal period prior to eyelid opening may need to a build up a build up of mucopurulent discharge behind the closed eyelid. This picture looks a little scary. It seems like the cat cat's going blind. Yeah. Treatment consists of pure premature opening of the pul pulpural fissure and irrigation of the ocular surface. The second picture, conjunctivitis. FHV1 is a major cause of acute and chronic conjunctivitis. The conjunctivitis is really bilateral, bilateral. And uh, most of the time, the conjunctivitis is with signs of hyperemia, serous ocular discharge, and a variable degree of chemosis. In the majority of cases, the clinical signs re resolve by 10 to 20 days post-infection. And recurrent acute conjunctivitis is a feature of viral recrudescence. 
severe conjunctivitis in kittens and adolescent cats may need to adhesion of conjunctiva to itself. That will create symblepherin. Look at the picture. We can see the nictitating membrane here. The nictitating membrane adhered to the palpebral conjunctiva. This is the symblepherin. And sometimes the conjunctiva may adhere to the cornea if corneal alteration has been present. That will create conjunctivalization of the cornea. We can see here the cornea has become blurred in this area. This is the conjunctivalization of the cornea. Okay. Let's look at other corneal damage caused by this virus. Let's look at the bottom picture first. The presence, this is the dendritic corneal ulceration. The presence of the dendritic corneal ulceration is the pathognomonic for FHV1 infection. Dendritic corneal ulceration typically manifests as linear or branching axonal defects. And the most of the time, this can be very fine in appearance. And therefore, it is recommended to do magnified examination under cobalt blue light following application of topical fluorescent. Small ulcers may fuse into larger ones. Sometimes, small ulcers may fuse into larger ones. That's why they get their form. That's why they form geographic corneal ulcer. Here, I see the blurred. Cornea. Yeah. That's why they form geographic corneal ulceration. Geographic corneal ulceration may be single or multiple, like this, a multiple in appearance. As what we can see in this picture, multiple geographic corneal ulceration. Okay, look at this picture. This is the chronic stromal keratitis. Following multiple bouts of adolescent, um, adolescent disease or periods of chronic ulceration, the corneal stromal may develop chronic inflammatory changes, including new vascularization, inflammatory cell infiltration, pigmentation, scarring, or fibrosis. Actually, it's a result of in ineffective immune response to the viral antigen sequestered in the cornea. And at present, there is no what method to convert to revert to reverse this condition? There's no good method to reverse this condition. Okay, let's look at the next pictures. Corneal sequestration. This term describes a focal area of corneal tumor degradation associated with a brown, brown here, brown to black, like this, black discoloration.
the majority of corneal sequestration cases are associated with chronic corneal ulceration or chronic keratitis. As such, FHV1 has been strongly implicated in the etiology of this condition. And most of the time, the corneal sequestration cases are not responsive to medical treatment. Then superficial keratectomy with or without grafting procedures is recommended. Now, this is the pictures of eosinophilic conjunctivitis and keratitis. Clinically, eosinophilic conjunctivitis and keratitis manifest, uh, manifest as a superficial, proliferative, irregular, white or pink, vascularized inflammatory, uh, infiltration of the conjunctiva and cornea. This condition may be unilateral or bilateral. And the, the role of FHV1 in its pathogenesis is uncertain. The diagnosis of this condition, diagnosis of, of this disease, is based on the clinical appearance and the cyto fi cyto cytology findings. Uh, only one eosinophil can make a definite diagnosis. If you find only one eosinophil, it will make sense. So when we do the cytology, we need to find the eosinophil. Only one can make sense. Okay, let's see. Let's look at this picture. I know it looks a lot like the one with what we just mentioned, the chronic stromal keratitis. Yes, it is the chronic stromal keratitis. But here, I want to talk about the problem of tear film caused by the virus. FHV1 induces qualitative tear film abnormalities in experimentally infected cats. Let's look at these photomicrographs of sections of conjunctival biopsy specimens from cats. Okay. In the picture on the left, we see normal conjunctiva. Goblet cells here, I mean these cells, they are dyed red. Goblet cells are numerous within the conjunctival epithelium. In normal conjunctiva. Okay, let's look at the middle picture. In the middle picture, we can see marked neutrophil, neutrophilic exudates and diffuse ulcers of the conjunctival epithelium at seven days after inoculation. And the, on the right, on the right, on the right, this picture. This is the sequimus metaplasia, metaplasia of conjunctival epithelium at 29 days after inoculation. We can see very few goblet cells in the conjunctival. Therefore, it is generally believed that FHV1 infection has been associated with the KCAs and a tear film instability. 
okay? It's very uncommon we encounter this skin disease. The lesions consist of viscous crests <coughs> and ulcers. Sorry. And also, <laughs> FHV1 DNA has been identified in the cats suffering from. <coughs> <sorry>. <coughs> Um, suffering from uh, UV, ulcerative dermatitis affecting the periocular skin. But this, this condition is very uncommon. Okay, the last picture. The link between FHV1 and anterior uveitis is less well defined. FHV1 may be a cause of this condition. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to the fourth topic, polymerase chain reaction test for FHV1. The PCR test identifies FHV1 by amplifying specific sequence of the viral DNA. Theoretically, the test has 100% specificity and extremely high sensitivity. Uh, BioGuard Corporation provides virus testing service this is the report from them. And now they are launching a PCR device for in-hospital testing. Simple three steps for PCR testing in clinics. If you are interested in this, please contact their staff. Okay, here's another question. The previous clinic did not detect FHV1 with PCR test, while the next clinic did. How did this happen? <coughs> How did this happen? If they use the same device or the same third party testing company, the most likely reason is that the sampling site is different. Here, the table, this table shows the relationship between sampling size with and uh, the detection rate. If only Conjunctive sample is taken. Some positive samples will be missed. And in fact, taking samples from different size significantly increase the detection rates for all the common respiratory pathogens. And interestingly, sampling from size with lesion did a lot increase the likelihood to detecting the infectious agents. Therefore, we need to take samples from different sites. That's very important. Okay, let's understand about why we get false positive and false negative results. Possible reasons for false positive, 
false positive cases, uh, latency and subclinical shading, and uh, vaccine interference. And uh, there are several possible reasons for false negative cases. Number one is intermittent viral shading by infected cats. We cannot be sure that samples were taken during the shedding period. We cannot do that. We cannot be sure that. And number two, inadequate sample collection. Just like what I mentioned, we need to collect samples from different sites. Number three, it may occur degenerate degradation of the DNA sample during transport. It may occur. Um, number four, the effects of topical anesthetics and fluorism. Both of them may reduce the sensitivity of PCR test. Okay, number five, even though the probability is very low, Clearly, errors in the laboratory PCR design or protocol may happen. Okay. As both po false positive and false negative testing is common, it is important for us to consider the overall clinic picture when attempting to make a diagnosis of FHV ocular disease. We know that dendritic corneal ulcer is the pathognomonic for FHV1 infection. A clinical diagnosis could be made based on this sign alone without the need to perform PCR test. However, most of the time, we need to consider the history, the clinical signs, diagnostic tests, and even response to treatment to make a final diagnosis, just like a jigsaw puzzle. Okay, the last topic, a review of antiviral drugs and other compounds with activity against FHV1. Before we get to drugs, uh, let's understand some important concepts about antiviral agents. Number one, antiviral agents tend to be more toxic than antibacterial agents. Why? Because FHV1 is a DNA virus and is an obligate intracellular organism with which replicates within the host nucleus. Therefore, antiviral agents tend to be more toxic. And often they often they may, may be only used topically. Even then, induce notable choral conjunctival cytotoxicity. Number two, all antiviral agents to date are viral static. Therefore, they cannot target latent virus and must be administered frequently. Number three and four, no antiviral drug has proven antibacterial activity and no antibacterial drug has proven antiviral activity. A drug cannot have both infection. Number five, antiviral drugs effective and safe in humans are not necessarily effective and safe in cats. They are different species. The infection is different sometimes. 
Okay, let's look at this table. Actually, there, there will be three similar tables and uh, each table describes one drug type. This type, actually, uh, this type is almost obsolete. Mm, it includes idoxyridine, vidarobin, trifluoridine, and cedophobia. As we can see, the safety and effic efficacy of this, this drug, of these drugs are not very good. And uh, most of the time, these drugs are hard to get. Okay, the second type, purine analogous and their oral products. This type includes AC, AC, acyclovir and its oral project, valacyclovir. Gansiclovir and its oral project, valgansiclovir. Pencyclovir and its oral project, femcyclovir, or femcyclovir, sorry. Uh, several reports of Gansiclovir's topical administration to cats, which showed is very, very promising, but, mm, but very few knowledge about the safety and efficacy has been reported in cats. So until now, uh, they is still lack of debt about the safety and efficacy in cats. Okay, let's focus on the well-studied femcyclovir. Femcyclovir is the oral project of pencyclovir. It's effective and relatively safety. safe. 17% of cats occurring, uh, receiving, receiving 40 or 90 milligram per kilogram thrice a day may have adverse events. Most frequently is the gastrointestinal event. The cats may vomit or have a diarrhea. 17% of cats. Okay. The metabolism is very complex in human and more complex in cats. Okay. Firstly, femcyclovir was converted into intermediate metabol uh, me metabolized in the blood liver and the small intestine with subsequent oxidation to pencyclovir by aldehyde oxidase in the liver. Mm. Neither femcyclovir nor the intermediate me metabolite, or intermediate metabolite, neither of them uh, has any has antiviral activity against FHG1. Oh, sorry, let's re repeat this sentence. Neither femcyclovir nor intermediate metabolite has any antiviral activity against FHG1. Therefore, complete metabolism to pencyclovir is very important. However, hepatic aldehyde oxidase here, this hepatic aldehyde oxidase activity in cats is, is about 2%. Here we can see. 2% of that in humans. 
if human, if the aldehyde oxidase activity in human is 100%, the cats, this oxidase is about 3% of that in humans and lower than in any other species to date. It's very low. So pharmacyclovia pharmacokinetics in the cat are extremely complex and nonlinear. In other words, doubling of pharmacyclovia dose does not need to doubling plasma pancyclovia concentration. Therefore, as a result, the recommended pharmacyclovia dose, according to the reported studies, is 90 milligram per kilogram orally. As for the time between doses, twice a day is as effective as twice, thrice a day. Therefore, it is recommended to give twice daily to dec decrease the client cost. Okay, let's look at other compounds with activity against the FHV1. This type includes lysine, interference, lactoferrin, pro probiotics, First of all, they are safe, but there's no significant treatment effects or lack of debt. As to these compounds, just anecdotal reports of the activity against FHV1. Okay, finally, let's take a look at several latest researchers. The first article is evaluation of compounded pseudophobia, pharmacyclovia, and gansyclovia for the treatment of FHV1 ocular surface disease in shelter house cats. The conclusion is topical ophthalmic pseudophobia were effective at least more effective than femciclovia and gansiclovia. The second article is comparative efficacy of topical ophthalmic gansiclovia and oral femciclovia in cats with experimental ocular FHV1 epithelial infection. They got the conclusion that Topical application of gansiclovia gel three times a so daily as similar to the treatment of twice daily oral femciclovia treatment in cats with experimental ocular FHV1 infection. The infection is similar between these different medicines. Okay, the third article is antiviral effects of adipose tissue derived MSC secretum against FCV and FHV. The conclusion is the feline MS, MSC secretum did not inhibit FCV or FHV1 viral and viral entry into the CRFK cells, but had antiviral effects on the replication of both FCV and FHV in a dose-dependent manner. Okay, the latest article is nanoparticle ocular immunotherapy for herpes virus surface eye infections evaluated in CAT infection model. They found treatment was well tolerated by all CATs and non-specific ocular immunotherapy offers significant promise 
as a no novel approach to treatment of FHV1 ocular infections. Therefore, this medication is very promising. Okay, that's all what I want to talk about today. And uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please let me know and I will try to answer them. Oh. Okay, hello everyone. And uh, I'd like to answer your question. And I see here several questions in the dialogue box. Okay, the first question, mm, actually I, <laughs> I don't understand clearly your question. How use chemical? Please, uh, please uh, describe your question in detail. And the second question, and I think you can consult with the staff of Belga company. Okay. And, okay. If you need a seminar file, please leave your email here. I uh, will send you the PDF file uh, after the webinar. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And um, the third question was the UVRTs. So here I'd like to uh, use, a, use a handwriting. <laughs> I try to here. Can you see my, oh, I can't write here. Okay, um, firstly, we need to understand what is UVR. UVR include um, iris, cilia body, ciliary body, and the choroid. So any part of these three sites have inflammation, that means um, the presence of UVITs. So UVIT means any, any part of iris, cellular body, and the uh, choroid have inf inflamed in this site, um, that means UVITs. And if the, the inflammation happened in iris and the ciliary body. Normally we call it anterior uveitis. And if the inflammation happened in the choroid, we call it posterior uveitis. And if all sides, three, three sides uh, have inflammation, we call it the uveitis. The whole place uveitis. I hope I can uh, I make it clear. Uh, the fourth question. Oh, still we you give us the email address uh, and the staff of BioCard will send this PPT for you. The four, the fifth question: Which antiviral agents? Um, I think I mentioned the, the antiviral agents lately in the uh, speak. So now is most frequently used medicine is famciclovir, and a dose is the recommended dose is ninety milligram per kilogram twice daily. Okay, next. Do you recommend vaccination of kittens after it was infected by FHV1? Yes, of course. Even though the kitten have been infected by FHV1, we still recommend to give vaccine for, for this kitten because the, the main vaccine we used is triple vaccine. 
so we can um, protect for other disease. Okay, is there any possible possibility to get an infection even after vaccination to cats? Of course, even though the cat have get uh, vaccinations, the cat still have the pro pro possibility to get infection because the vaccine can't protect the cat per 100 perfect. 100%. And uh, why antiviral are nucleotide analogous? Um, actually, I don't know, but there are other compounds still have the antiviral activity, but most, um, now the main antiviral drug, yes, still are nuclear, nucleotide analogous because um, they find this kind of medicine, this kind of drug have the efficacy to antiviral, have the activity. Yes, I, I see Clovia safe for, cat, for cats. Um, that depends how you use this drug, if you use the acyclovir <coughs> topically and uh, in 0.5% dilution, that's safe. But if you use it orally, that will have toxicity. Uh, what are the main diagnostic signs? Mm. The <coughs> FHV1 have a um, say, what you say? Is have have a very very uh, typical classic sign that's dendritic ulcer, corneal ulcer. So, um, if you see the dendritic corneal ulcer, you can make a diagnose to. Of, uh, of FHV1 infection. So what is the differential diagnosis? Actually, there are other um, agents can cause conjunctivitis, can cause eye disease. Mm. Most frequently is FCV, Khaleesi virus, F feline Khaleesi virus, and uh, chlamydia. Sometimes myco mycoplasma also cause conjunctivitis. So if when you see a cat with eye disease, if especially conjunctivitis, you need to uh, do a test, PCR test usually in China, uh, we, we track all these agents together. And uh, can you name some pharmacy clovia available in market? Uh, in China, we use human medicine, actually. <laughs> we, we, don't have um, medicine for veterinarian. And uh, I know Novart, Novart, I don't know the English name, Novart company, they have the medicine for veterinarian. Okay, can we give the topical antibi antibacterial to prevent infection? If yes, what antibiotic drug you prefer to give? Okay, and um, most time there will happen secondary bacterial infection. 
actually. So if we find the author, if um, both both conjunctivity, both conjunctival and corneal ulcer, if we find any ulcer happened, we need to give um, antibacterial drug to, to, to proven infection. And uh, mostly I use Cobromycin. Also, you can use naval fluxation, but tobromycin can be the first line medicine. Mm. What is differential diagnosis of FHV1? Um, mostly, we need to um, recognize FHV1 and FCV, chlamydia, and uh, mycoplasma. And sometimes they are um, another bacteria also cause um, respiratory symptom, but no eye disease. If antivirus is not safe, what, what therapy should be used for, the, for this herpes virus case? Mm. No, we think Famsiclovir is safe already. And of course, most, most kind of antivirus drug um, not safe when they use orally. They just can be used topically. But um, fancy clavier is safe when we use um, 40 to 90 milligram per kilogram, twice daily or three daily. Do you have any experience with combination, combinating famsiclovir orally and ansiclovir topically? Actually, I don't, I never use, uh, I never use the famsiclovir and ansiclovir together. Sometime, um, I will, I, I use famsiclovir orally and ganciclovir topically combine these two medicines together. But from the article, I, I just show you, uh, the article sh showed us, we, we can choose one method, it's okay. They are the same in efficacy. So after I read, I read this article, I just use one medicine every time. And if an antiviral medicines are not available in my area, what other option, option to treat the disease? If you don't have any antiviral medicine to use, <laughs> you can use the lysine, the, I mean, other compounds, lysine, and the uh, probiotic, oh, lactoferrin to, to improve the, the, the body antiviral ability. What is the prognosis? Mm, treatments other than antiviral and how effective? Oh. I don't know, understand your question. What's the prognosis? 
Mm. Most time, and almost all, almost all the cats will become lifelong carrier. Um, yeah, and uh, after the acute uh, phase, acute phase, they will they will into a latency latency state. So that seem, seems normally, no symptoms. But if they encounter stressors, they will um, go back in the acute phenomenon, like conjunctivitis or UVI or all all the corneal ulceration or just the respiratory uh, symptom like sneezing. Can vaccine protect cat? Actually, vaccine can partially protect cat, but not 100%. Is there any disinfectant to clear off FHV? In present, no. Um, some article said is one hundred percent to to have a lifelong carrier, but some article said is eighty eighty percent, but. Normally, most of scholars, they think is a long life carrier of FHV1. There's no method to disinfectant. Okay. If I miss your question, please tell me and, uh, and uh, put in the dialogue, dialogue box again. I try to answer it. Okay, if there is no more questions, uh, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Luo for her fantastic presentation in this topic. Uh, we'll just say good night to all of you now and hope you enjoy the uh, presentation today and keep attending our webinar. Uh, next month. Thank you and good night.